Welcome back. Um, it is a uh, it is a challenge, I know, to go from 9 a.m. till you know almost almost five with the conference. Um, and I was saying earlier that whenever I think about the success or failure of a particular event, um, I have no objective way of measuring how things have gone, and so I just choose subjective and selfish measures. Um, I've been thoroughly entertained throughout the day. <laughs> I have learned a lot. Um, I have thought the moments of High disagreement were very entertaining. I thought the moments of surprising agreement were very telling. Um, and I think that um, today was the kind of day that I had hoped it'd be, and I hope that you all um, pick something from it that you can use. Um, and I think we are really ending on a high note as far as I'm concerned. Um, I did say what a, what a priority it was for me uh, to make sure that we engage government regulators um, to find out how all of these themes kind of play out in their day-to-day -day practice. And it's my distinct honor to have with us Commissioner Julie Brill of the Federal Trade Commission. She's been a commissioner since uh, April of 2010. And before that, she has a long and decorated career um, as a professional uh, government uh, agent, as a servant, working on consumer protection issues, most notably in the North Carolina Department of Justice, uh, and in the Attorney General's office in the state of Vermont. Um, of course, the highlight of her entire career uh, was her stint as an adjunct lecturer in a law school. Um, it's, it's surprising to me that you'd want to even do anything after you've had that job. Um, she has, since she's taken uh, her role as the commissioner, been tireless, active, and focused on most of the issues that we've been talking about all day today. I mean, she's living uh, the themes that we've been discussing, um, and you know, a year and a half in, I think it's a great moment to take stock with Commissioner Brill and, and see what we've learned, what we haven't learned. Um, at one point, we wanted uh, the commissioner to stand up and just talk, but I think we both agreed that we'll make it a conversation and exchange between the two of us. Um, but because I imagine there are also questions on the audience, uh, Commissioner Brill has graciously said, we'll spend about half the time just the two of us, and then half the time opening up the questions to all of you. Um, so without further ado, um, let's get started. Um, so Joe Farrell, I'm glad he pointed out, it's not been about a year, it's been precisely one year mm -hmm. since the FTC issued its privacy report. And I'd love to get the status update on what has happened in the year. Um, and you know, I think it would be interesting to hear from your vantage point, having started before the issuance of the report, has anything changed because of the existence of the report? Um, does the commission do things differently? Uh, does it serve as this guiding document as you think about your docket? Um, what should we make of the FTC draft report a year later? Sure, so for, um, first of all, I, I agree. This, th thank you for having me here. Thank you for inviting me. Thanks to um, Phil Weiser, wherever he is, for inviting me. Um, I, this um, has been a great conference, and I think the conversation has been really interesting. And what's amazing to me is how much of it does touch on the day-to-day -day work that we do do at the Federal Trade Commission. We, we don't centrally plan all data flows in the country <laughs> as much as we might wish to, um, or some of us might wish to. Uh, but, but we do deal with all these issues um, literally on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, it's been a really busy year on the privacy front. Um, I think we've had a lot of tremendous successes, not just the privacy report, the draft report which was issued, as Joe pointed out, um, one year ago, but we've had some really significant settlements. We've, t we've touched on the Facebook settlement which um, was announced last week. Um, we've had some great um, uh, parallel cases involving Twitter, um, involving Google for its Google Buzz launch. So we pretty much have um, spoken loudly and clearly on social networks and what social networks need to do with respect to their members. We've had some great cases involving behavioral advertising and what needs to be said and, and um, then performed upon with respect to consumers when they're told about the choices that they have with respect to behavioral advertising. We've had um, some great COPPA cases, that's the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act. I'm actually, it's actually sort of interesting that there hasn't been any discussion today yet about COPPA, incredibly important law um, and, and rule that we, that we deal with. So, uh, so um, we've, just, we've just sort of covered the gamut in terms of privacy this past year, and I think that um, what the report did, just to, to touch on that, uh, uh, which is really what your question is, you know, the, the report wasn't so much um, setting up where the commission was going to go on privacy 
as much as, in my view, it was really informed by the difficulties in the enforcement realm that we've seen in our casework, what were some of the problems in terms of the limitations of the law, the limitations of concepts of notice and choice um, as they have been traditionally understood, limitations of concepts around harm. You know, a lot of the things that we've been talking about um, and have been dealt with in cases that the Commission has had in the past. So I looked at the privacy report as kind of a, a, a summing up of where we've been more than a, a, a snapshot or a, a video of where we're going to go in the future. Um, but having said that, you know, the, the, the report did lay out some, you know, and I don't know how many of you have even read it or um, bothered to become familiar with it. I know the academics in the room have, but I, I, was, I met the students in the room. Um, you know, it, what we do is we, we lay out three principles. We talk about um, uh, the need to have privacy built in to products and services from the beginning. Rather than waiting for a data breach to happen or some other disaster to happen, we're, we, we believe that companies need to be thinking about privacy from the get-go. It's a concept that's known as privacy by design, but I, I don't like to use those terms that much because I think that, you know, like do not track, it kind of obfuscates what you're really talking about once you start labeling something. So it's really thinking about privacy very early on um, in product development. A second point in the, in the report is to try to simplify notices and notice and choice, something that we had an entire, practically an entire panel on. Um, so, it, you know, recognizing, for instance, in the mobile space, we haven't spent a lot of time today talking about mobile, but when you're thinking about notifying consumers about the choices that they might have, and you look at a privacy policy on a mobile phone, you know, our, our technologists have clicked through some, you know, over a hundred times to read some privacy policies. You know, that's just not acceptable in terms of a, a regime for informing consumers about what their choices are. So, and that's just one example. I mean, obviously there's lots of other technological advances, but the concept of simplifying notices, trying to give consumers more layered information so that the primary information, uh, sorry, more layered notices, sorry, so that the primary information is given first, either through icons or symbols or whatever, and then more detailed information is available if they want it. Those kinds of um, concepts, the concept that somebody, Joe, I think, said he didn't like our chief of um, our, the Bureau of Economics says he doesn't like the notion of commonly accepted practices. You know, that notion is to try to eliminate from privacy notices those kinds of practices that consumers don't really need to hear about. And typically in the old privacy policies, Chris Hufenagel and Alicia can tell us better because they've read so many of them, those are the practices that are always right up front. You know, we're going to share with the people who we're going to hire to send you the product that you're now purchasing. Okay, well, you know, everybody knows that. You know, we're going to share, and then there's a series of, of, of entities that people are going to share with which don't really matter um, all that much. And it's only in the last couple of paragraphs where everyone has already fallen asleep or clicked I accept or whatever. That's when sort of the really interesting kind of sharing gets disclosed. So that's a concept in the report. And then another concept is transparency and giving consumers access to their information that's in proportion to the sensitivity of the information. Now, in terms of like what's happened as a result of the report, to me, and, and you know, we can talk about this, you know, one of the concepts or one of the proposals that we as, as the commissioners have gotten around, at least the majority of the commissioners have wrapped their arms around, is this concept of do not track. Um, and that kind of came under the rubric of simplifying notices. You know, let's, let's give consumers a mechanism for making choices that's more simple. Well, it's just been a year. And when you think about all the advancements that have taken place in the do not track space, both with respect to the browser-based um, projects that are underway, Alicia's leading some and others are very involved in that, and also with respect to the advertisers. A lot of people here I know don't like this program, a lot of concerns about it, but here it is. You know, it's an actually, it's in a program. The commission had been calling for it for, I don't know, three years. Since we came out with our report a year ago, they, they've gotten their act together and they've put something, something uh, down. So I think the, and, and just this, you know, conferences like this, just the conversations that are happening around privacy and setting up, setting up systems and thinking about systems to really enable consumers to effectuate choices, I think, um, I think it's been pretty remarkable. So I'd love to drill down on a 
a number of the themes sure. you already raised for us. Uh, I can think of Do Not Track and uh, Notice and Choice and Harm. Harm is Harm has surprisingly been absent from the conversation today, so let's get to yes. that in a few minutes. But let's start with Do Not Track. And, and I think from my vantage point, I haven't taken part, I've been on the sidelines on the Do Not Track debate. I've been amazed at the kind of level of, of debate, um, sometimes quite passionate debate around there. Um, in, this, in the very brief discussion we have had with it today, um, you know, the question was, what does it mean when a cu consumer clicks that box, when right. they say Do Not Track, right. And of course, because I'm going to guess, but maybe maybe you'll surprise me and maybe you'll tell us exactly what it means. <laughs> but, but assuming you won't, but then the question is who decides? Right. Who decides? And then maybe a third question, who enforces? Okay, right. So those are three yeah. do not track questions. Those are all really important questions. Um, so right now, unfortunately, I think, I think we, we don't, I, I can't sit here and tell you this is what everyone understands do not track to mean. Um, because there is not a, 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 um, a coalescing of, of an understanding of those words. You know, and even, you know, listening to Alicia talk about it, you know, she has a concept and she talked about it in terms of the header-based solution. That is one way for consumers to effectuate a choice is going in and using a dashboard and saying, here's what, I'm, here's what I want, um, uh, you know, in terms of my privacy choices. And it would be a header that would be communicated to others. One of the problems with that solution is are people going to actually listen? Are the advertisers and ad networks and others going to honor those messages that come through with respect to the headers? Um, another mechanism for do not track is the um, list-based mechanism that Microsoft and others had advanced, sort of a blacklist, whitelist, which is a more, dr some advertisers have called it a more draconian um, way to deal with do not track. Basically what they do is they create lists of websites which are the ones that are going to have the privacy practices that consumers want, which are the ones that won't, and they will not allow a consumer to get through to that, that, to that website unless the consumer takes extra steps. Fairly, fairly draconian. Um, that's another way to effectuate do not track. Um, and yet then there's this icon-based system, which um, shows up, you know, little, someone talked about the little triangles that appear underneath ads. The, the folks who've put this together are um, the majority of um, advertisers and ad networks uh, in the nation, um, and they claim that um, billions of those images have been served up to consumers. But the big question you're asking is, so what does it mean? If, if, I, if a consumer says, I don't want you to track me, do we even know, does that mean just don't, don't use my information to serve up ads based on my behavior on other websites? That's what I think a lot of people think it means. I think um, that's what some people believe the advertisers are saying it means. I actually think they're saying it means more than that. I personally believe that a do not track system, um, it must also deal with collection of information. Mm -hmm. How much information can be collected <coughs> and retained? And that whole issue of collection and retention is one of the areas where, as you say, there's a tremendous amount of, of debate right now. Um, there are other debates around um, uh, other issues like comp like w what are the practices that we're going to allow and do not track? Are we going to allow ad optimization? Are we going to allow um, fraud detection? And then, and then you start, once you get beyond those two, you start to get into areas where there's, there's a lot of concern about what would be allowed or not allowed, even if a consumer opts to not be tracked. So there's, and who decides? Right. I mean, because you said I... Alicia's right. deciding. No. Um, but you no. said, you, you said no. this, but I think, it believe, I think it includes the collection piece. Yeah, right? I do. But, I, but, but, so I'm the separate just, question then is, should, is that, does the commission have a role to play in saying, oh, and by the way, if Alicia decides it doesn't include the collection piece, we might beg to differ. Right. So, in and, the re way. and the reason why I'm pointing to Alicia is because she's leading some of the working right. groups in W3C, which is a standard setting body, which is focused on this header based solution. So, just for those of you who, who may not know. But um, <coughs> I think the right now, you know, we have as a commission said um, that we want do not track. The staff has said they would like it to include uh, collection. I mean, that's been quite clear. When we issue our final privacy report, which hopefully will come by the end of this year, but it might bleed over into 2012 a little bit, um, I, I'm hopeful that it will still contain that notion that it, this concept must include collection. But in the absence of legislation, 
that sets forth a do not track system, likely who's going to be making these decisions will be um, self-regulatory groups or standard setting groups. So a W3C type of entity, um, a group like um, D the DAA, the Digital Advertising Alliance and their partners, um, or the browser companies um, will be making these decisions and then once uh, these promises are made to consumers, uh, then it will be up to entities like us and also our partners in the state AG offices to enforce them. Because after all, when an entity says, I will abide by the do not track principles, they're promising to live, live up to them. And that's where the co-regulatory relationship comes in because then we have a role in enforcing it. So um, you've you referred several times now to these kind of self-regulatory, um, but essentially are still notice or disclosure regimes. Yes. Um, in our first panel, we had two people who think about this all the time, Laurie Craner and Alessandro Quisti, um, express some, some, a fair amount of skepticism about the entire project of notice and choice. I mean, I think the theme, if I'm accurately depicting it, was we really, this is deck chairs on the Titanic time, and, and, and our, our faith in notice and choice has been proved wrong. Let me call them Laurie Prime and Alessandro Prime, so I'm not putting words in there. Okay. People who look a lot like them um, said this. Um, <laughs> So the question is... Is Lori still here? Is she still here? Oh, there she is. Okay. That's Lori Prime, actually. Oh, that's Lori Prime. Okay. Yeah, it's All very right. hard to tell All this right. light. Right. Um, and so, so the question is, is the, is the commission... Where's the commission on this? I mean, you're right. In the report, it was, it, there was a lot in there about simplification and the kind of nutrition labeling that Lori, I think, was beginning to say... Lori Prime was beginning to say just doesn't work. Um, should the commission have been more aggressive? Should it be more aggressive maybe in the final report about... You know, notice and choice has some serious limitations, and it's only good to a point, but we need other solutions. So, um, um, <laughs> I'm trying to think of how best to answer okay. this. Um, the, the truth of the matter is, you know, especially for the students who, who might not even realize what the commission is. You know, we're, the, the commission has a huge staff of, you know, over a thousand people, people like Joe, economists, lots and lots of attorneys. It's divided between consumer protection and antitrust. Um, we do all sorts of things. We cover the waterfront in terms of consumer protection and competition work. We're run, we are, an, uh, we're, uh, uh, the agency is run by five commissioners. Right now we're four. We have a, we have a, um, uh, a vacancy. No more than three from the same party can uh, be uh, a commissioner. So it's a bipartisan commission. Right now, we happen to have three Democrats and one Republican, but assuming um, the nomination of uh, uh, Maureen Allhausen goes through, we will be back up to full strength, um, three re Democrats and two Republicans. Uh, what I have found in my um, over a year and a half as a commissioner is there is a remarkable amount of um, uh, agreement really almost violent agreement about our enforcement work. Uh, when it comes, when the rubber hits the road and we're dealing with a particular case, um, almost all of our decisions, particularly in privacy, particularly in consumer protection generally, are 5-0 or 4-0 if someone's recused. Competition side, it gets a little bit more complicated. Where we, where we start to differ and um, this is a long way of trying to answer your question, or somewhat long way, it's not that long, con compared to some of the other speakers earlier today. When we get to the theory and we're not dealing with a particular practice in a particular company, then I think we, get, we, we start to diverge more because it's, it's all sort of theoretical and everybody, each of the commissioners has something different in his or her mind about what we're really talking about, what the real world is like and what that image then means for the theory that we're talking about. So I will say that I do think we differ on this point, this very point that you're asking. I mean, you, one can look at some of my co-commissioners and, and a, one former um, co-commissioner's statements that they issued when the draft privacy report came out about this very notion of the importance of notice and choice versus moving away from it. So I don't want to put words in their mouth about what they believe. You can read it. It's all on our website. We're the most transparent agency I've ever seen in my life. But um, where I come down is I, I think I come down more on the side of Lori and Ale Alessandro Prime. Um, <laughs> I, I think that um, there's a, a lot of complication around privacy and we're putting way too much burden 
on consumers to try to figure this all out. You know, when we think about the concept in economics, which I was actually surprised I didn't hear any of the economists talk about today, despite the fact that I plugged Joe to try to mention it, and he ignored me when we met about this a couple of days ago. I mean, there's this whole concept of least cost avoiders, and consumers are not the least cost avoiders here, I think in trying to figure out each and every consumer who's going on a website, trying to figure out what's happening with their information. If you add that up across all the gazillions of consumers that are on Facebook, for instance, or dealing with Google or whatever, there's a tremendous cost there. And I think that we need to be thinking a little bit more. And I don't want to go too far with this, because I do think notice and choice has a very important role. I don't think we should throw that out, just like I don't think we should throw out PII. I mean. Your work demonstrates that it's a very difficult concept um, uh, to rely on solely because of the whole way in which consumers can be re-identified. Incredibly important work that you've done. But I don't think that means that we should say, OK, no, we, we, we shouldn't um, uh, require companies to eliminate personally identifiable information. I mean, we still want that as a first step. Similarly, I think we still want notice and choice out there trying to co educate consumers, trying to give them intelligent choices. But I think we're in a world now where we need to build a little bit more under the hood and not have quite so much on the dashboard. I just think it's too confusing for consumers. And the analogy, I mean, there's two analogies I use in this, in this realm. One is, you know, it's sort of like an airplane. Right, consumers get on the airplane, they kind of sometimes look in the cockpit and see does the, you know, air, does the, the uh, pilot look drunk or not, you know, sort of check him out as you're going back to your seat. He looks okay, all right, I'm feeling good. I mean, you don't want to have to deal with all the choices that are out there. You know, um, when I was flying out here, they were talking about, well, we're over our weight limit, we got to move our, our the, the suitcases around and reshuffle fuel and all that stuff. I mean. We, we don't, you know, we don't, number one, I don't even want to hear that stuff. And I certainly, certainly don't want to have to make choices about that. Like, okay, let's take a vote. How many of you want us to shift suitcases to this side and how many of you want us to dump fuel? I mean, imagine what that world would be like. I, so I, I think the, the whole safety concept is one that, that we might want to be thinking a little bit more about here in light of how complicated this has become. And now to bring it to a real consumer protection, so that's more like consumer product safety and FAA, you know, um, Federal Aviation Administration type of regulation. But another much example that's much closer to the work that I do is with respect to mortgages and mortgage disclosures. I mean, I think one of the things that we learned in the downturn, there were lots and lots of reasons why we went through the Great Recession. But one of them, undoubtedly, was that consumers didn't really understand, some consumers, many, most, we don't know what the percentage is, but, but a lot of consumers did not understand what was happening with respect to their mortgages, what they were signing up for, and what were the risks with respect to what they were signing up for if the market took a dive or kept in the same direction. You know, what, what were the elements that went into the determination that they qualified for that mortgage? So one of the things that we're seeing now in Washington is a discussion about trying to simplify mortgage disclosures and mortgage products so that consumers can really understand what's happening. I think, I think there's some good analogies there with respect to privacy as well. So I don't want to throw out notice and choice. I think my, my co-commissioners who think that we really need to stick with that, you know, they have their perspective and that's a very valid perspective. I don't want to throw it away, but I, I, I want to move a little bit more towards building more under the dashboard for consumers. I've certainly never thought that when I looked in the cockpit, but I am sure for the rest of my life I will now, and I'll think, Whether they're drunk. Julie Brill, yeah. this is you. Um, <laughs> So I, there are so many other questions I want to ask, and, and, and I'll just tee one up but not ask it, and maybe one of you can just repeat it for me during Q&A, um, which is you and I had a conversation about big data yes, and yes. harms, but let's put yes. that to the side for now, because I, I do want to ask you one more question, and it's no small question. It's the big question that's been hanging over the entire day, which is, so, so what is a regulator supposed to do, or what, for that matter, are private participants or academics supposed to do in deciding what is the proper approach to any specific privacy problem, right? Is it going to be self-regulation? Is it going to be regulation? And even within there, is it the FTC enforcing the common law thing that we started the day with? Right. Or rulemaking? Does Congress need to step in? Regulation by raised eyebrow, co-regulate, I mean, there are a thousand variations. Give us the rubric. I mean, give us the, you know, here is the rule book for figuring out 
the things we need to look for to decide from that gigantic menu of options. You know, if I could give you that playbook, you know, I, boy, I would, be, I, I, would, I would be in a very different job than I am right now. Um, you know, that's the thing I think that people in my position and all, all around Washington and the states, I mean, everyone who deals with trying to um, improve the lives of consumers as well as maintain innovation for businesses and ma you know maintain a thriving economy which is also uppermost in our minds you know it's a very difficult balance on some level when you go through that list right um, you started with the I don't know what order they go the eyebrow the nudge you know the the bully pulpit um, uh, working with self-regulatory regimes working with individual companies um, seeking regulation you know kind of an ex ante regulation um, or instead doing ex post enforcement, which is a lot of what we do based on our, you know, no unfair methods of competition, no unfair and deceptive acts and practices shall be allowed in, in commerce. You know, that, that's the, the rule and it leads for a lot of ex post enforcement and then to legislation. You know, that gradation of tools that we have or arrows in our quiver, we're going to use them all. Right? And, and, and we do use them all. I use them all. I use the bully pulpit a lot. I raise my eyebrows a lot. You know, my eyebrows are very flexible. Um, I was once asked at a, a, a um, conference of um, privacy professionals, uh, when did I think uh, the do not track systems need to be, needed to be put in place? And I looked at my watch and I said, what time is it? <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, there's, there's actually a lot of value to the bully pulpit. I do think um, industries care a great deal about what people like I think and not uh, because of my, I, you know, I don't have any grand, grandiose view of myself. It's because of my position because I get to make decisions, right? Um, and, and they care and they want to do, there are a lot of businesses that want to do the right thing. And they want to know, they don't want to necessarily define what the right thing is. They do. They want, to, they want to tell me what I should think is the right thing. And they do that. But then they want to know, okay, where do you come down? How should we be shaping this? And so there's a lot of dialogue that goes on at that uh, more granular level between um, staff. We, we have lots of staff that's talking to industry all the time. I talk to industry all the time, and I talk to their, their trade groups and groups like you know the About Ads group and folks like the W3C. That's something that I think is very important. Um, we have to take into account the political environment, right? So. A discussion a year ago about legislation would have been very, very different than the discussion that we would have today about legislation. I mean, while I think that there is some value to having um, legislation around some privacy issues, uh, data breach notification, data security, um, I think privacy by design principles, I think there's some other principles in some of the bills that are out there that could be very helpful for everyone to know what the rules of the road are. I just don't politically see that happening right now. I'm just, you know, predicting the way it, there's so much that, that everybody's dealing with in Congress right now uh, in terms of the deficit and whatnot. I just don't think there's the bandwidth, frankly, to deal with this issue. So that means, and, and industry knows that. We know that, industry knows it. So that means their reaction to some of the things that we say on the bully pulpit you know, are, are going to be different because they're going to say, okay, well, you and, you and whose uncle are going to come out there and, and, and enforce this. Um, so, so we really have to use all of these tools. We do use all the tools, and our ability to use them uh, changes depending upon the climate. Great. Really. So that's how's, that for, how's that for the broadest answer to the broadest question I know, I know. that and I could possibly I wasn't. Ask. I was going to write down the exact recipe, but you didn't give it to me, so <laughs> sadly. Um, okay, so for the final time today, we're going to invoke the wiser rule. <laughs> Um, and I can't call on Jana because she's already speaking, Spoke, spoken, speaking. But she's still um, a student. She's still a student. Have you graduated in the last half an hour? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you do have a question. Please. Unless Lauren wants to take it instead. Okay. <laughs> or Brian, are you dying to ask a question? Brian's willing to ask a question. Let's, let's have a new voice. Let's have a new voice. Give that to Brian. We can take two students. It's okay. I realize I'm surrounded by academics, so I hope I don't sound too stupid. Um, you had mentioned... Uh, There's no stupid question. <laughs> okay, There's only I'll... stupid answers, honestly. And anyone who tells you differently, they're wrong. <laughs> Thank you. I feel better. Um, uh, you had mentioned uh, transparency as being part of the 
your paper. Um, right. I was just wondering what exactly, or wondering if you could speak more on to that sure. as to what exactly is transparent, what level of detail does a company have to reveal? Are you talking about saying we're sharing, or right. do you have to say, is it not to say we're sharing, or that you're selling this information to a third party? And I also wonder how that relates to third parties who um, might have their cookies on somebody else's site and how that relates to transparency. Because a lot of times uh, there are sites, I think it was msn.com, it was in the Wall Street Journal a few months ago. Um, they were <coughs> accident, they didn't realize that they were giving away some third party cookie that they had no idea was there. Um, and that company that owned the cookie, they had no idea that their cookie was on MSN's site. So I wonder, um, is there some sort of safe harbor for those companies or, or just, I guess, to what extent does transparency go and how far? So that's a very good question. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <laughs> and I was very quick about that because I, a lot of people here have read, you know, the draft report because it was a, very, a, se a really seminal piece and so I didn't want to waste too much time talking about it. But the transparency concept is actually very important and it's related to the concept of notice and choice. Um, so what, what we're talking about with respect to transparency is giving consumers more information not only about the kind of practices that you're talking about which are you know how are you using my information and what kind of choices will you give me and and what are you collecting but also to a certain extent showing consumers the data that you have about them that is if a company is collecting data and it's a particularly sensitive type of data or it can be used in a sensitive way and I'll talk about what that means in a second giving consumers access to it that it means they get to see it and then under appropriate circumstances giving consumers the right to correct it or potentially delete it that's the kind of access and control that is also a part of transparency. So for those of you who know the Fair Credit Reporting Act regime, um, and it was alluded to on one of the panels earlier today, the Fair Credit Reporting Act requires credit reporting agencies to give consumers access to the information that's in your credit report. You get, you get it once free a year, um, twice in some states. Um, if you're denied credit, you get a free copy of it. And the reason for that is because that information is so sensitive in terms of how it's used. It's used to deny you credit, to deny you jobs, to deny you promotions um, for insurance or the rates that you'll pay for all these kinds of things. So it's, it plays such a critical role that Congress has said, we're gonna require credit reporting companies to give consumers access to that information and the ability to correct it if it's incorrect. Because incorrect information, I forget who it was, what is it, Alessandro? It was someone who talked about 95% of the time the, you know, this information kind of works well, but then there's the 5% where, where it's disastrous because it's wrong. And so the Fair Credit Reporting Act has this concept of giving consumers the ability to correct. We are saying that there are um, data brokers and other entities that may not come strictly under the Fair Credit Reporting Act or maybe would, you know, there's sort of this potential gray area, but where consumers ought to have some access to that information. And again, depending upon the sensitivity of its use and the sensitivity of, of the information itself, perhaps the ability to uh, uh, correct it. So that's the whole concept of, or that's part of, I mean, it's a broad concept. It's related to notice and choice because it also deals with transparency about practices. The, the collection and use for behavioral advertising is also a concept within, within transparency. So we did start seven and a half minutes late, and so I'm going to go seven and a half minutes uh, past the bottom of the hour. So we have a, some time. Eric has got his hand high. Um, are you going to talk about affiliate marketing? No. Okay, good. <laughs> we, we argued about this are last night. Here? What? There, she doesn't have to answer, so I guess No, no, I do. But. <laughs> well, what are the answers then? <laughs> <Yeah>. So. <laughs> we did just, we argued about this last night at dinner. <laughs> Um, so, uh, actually, I want to follow up on where Paul was going, uh, but I want to give a more specific application to it. Um, it's impossible to ignore that there's been a, uh, a, a tsunami of uh, privacy-related rela lawsuits against Internet companies uh, in the last uh, year to two. And uh, it's also impossible to ignore that almost all of those have been tossed very quickly um, on the harm ground. 
rights, either on Article III standing grounds, saying that um, there was no uh, recognizable damage, or uh, on the elements, that there's just no harm that could be recognized. Um, and so I'm curious uh, what that uh, dynamic does to the FTC's thinking about uh, this situation. Does the FTC look at this as a situation where um, things seem to be working out fine, the courts have already taken on the issues and it's being addressed uh, appropriately, or does that to say, boy, the courts are really screwing up and um, it looks like we need to go and uh, step in. And in particular, I would note that some of these lawsuits do very much relate to situations where there's been breaches of privacy policies. Uh, the, the Amazon case from yesterday is only one example where there was express representations made to consumers along the way and the courts are still tossing it. So the, co so the concept of harm comes to play in at least two ways in these cases. In the private cases, consumers that are even alleging a deception um, theory need to show damages. And that's one of the ways in which many of these cases are thrown out when private plaintiffs bring them because they have to show that there was some cognizable damage that a court can recompense um, in these cases. The Federal Trade Commission and the state's, state attorney generals do not suffer from that same problem, if you will. When we bring a deception case, we don't have to show that anyone was actually harmed. We just have to show that it was a deceptive act and, and um, you know, consumers could have uh, 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 acted based upon the information that they were given that was inappropriate, uh, as an example of a deceptive act. Um, so that's one harm concept uh, that I'm not sure we're really addressing at all in our report. It's a difficulty that private plaintiffs have uh, in terms of bringing any kind of case. There's another concept or another way in which harm comes into privacy uh, matters, and that's through the unfairness concept. Again, I elided very briefly over our authority, but we basically bring um, uh, actions for deceptive um, uh, acts and also unfair acts. And unfairness requires and I think someone alluded to it in one of the panels, a balancing of economic interests. And there, the concept of harm is very important, not only to individuals who can also bring an unfairness claim, they would have to show economic damage in addition, but it's also important to us because in an unfairness matter where we are balancing economic interests, there we do need to show a concept of harm to consumers. And I think, again, it was talked about earlier today, you know, that notion, that balancing that has to happen, I think it's a good thing. I think it's a good thing that that's been made a part of our concept of unfairness. It's been there since now, it's been 31 years. And I think it's a good thing that we have to do it. But I think it's a difficult concept to have to deal with when you're in the realm of privacy. Because the question becomes, what, what about embarrassment? What about the fact that someone was outed as being, I don't know, you know, a Wiccan or whatever, and they didn't want to be outed as being that. Um, or, you know, you're dealing with a concept where, um, you know, photos are put on your Facebook page. You didn't want them there. Now, now we know that we're given some choices about trying to get rid of them, but even just having them up there for a brief period of time was just, you, it, it, was, it, it was not something you put up. You were, you were tagged, someone else tagged you, so it gets put on your page because that's what the whole facial recognition thing is doing for Facebook now. And, you know, how do we monetize that those notions. I think that's an area where we are trying we're trying to address that in the draft report we talked about the need to perhaps expand some of these concepts of harm um, in that unfairness realm or when we're dealing with our unfairness jurisdiction. Now interestingly enough when the commission was uh, dominated by um, Republicans in the early 2000s there was a case it was a, essentially a privacy case and honestly it's it was a um, it was a pharmaceutical company. I'm not remembering right now which one it was. I don't think it was um, Pfizer. It might have been Merck. But it was a company that was running a list for um, Prozac users. Who makes Prozac? Whoever you what was it? No, it wasn't Baxter. It was Lilly. Thank you. Thank you. You get an A, too. Um, it was Eli Lilly. Thank you. And Eli Lilly was running a um, website uh, for Prozac uh, users where they could kind of get information about it, and maybe get updates on how it should be used. Anyway, it, it's, Eli Lilly decided to shut down the website. And what they did when they sent an email out to all of the participants in the website, by mistake, was put in the two 
address or the CC address, the actual email addresses of everyone who was participating in this website. And this was at a time when email addresses often were actually identifying who you were. It was your name at gmail.com or whatever. And that was really considered to be a huge breach. I mean, these were people who never thought that they would, their, their name or something very close to their name would be disclosed as someone who was following a website for Prozac uh, users. And they might have been following it because their daughter or son or someone, or they were just interested in it. They were a doctor. I mean, there could have been the zillion reasons why they were following it. But you can see the implications for it. The commission um, brought a case against Eli Lilly, as did a, a, a number of states. And if you look at the um, allegations in that case, it's actually very interesting. What we alleged, we, I say we because it was the commission. I was obviously not on the commission at that time. Um, the commission alleged that the disclosure of those um, email addresses in the absence of consumer consent was either a deceptive or an unfair act. So they didn't have to address specifically whether there was harm involved with that disclosure. But from my perspective, it was clearly an unfairness case. And from my perspective, it, sh it, sh it should have been brought as an unfairness case. And I think that our concept of harm in the balancing that we have to do in unfairness should have incorporated that. So um, I know you academics are used to long-winded answers, so I'm not going to apologize for the long-windedness of that answer. But it's a complicated area in terms of how harm comes into this. And I do think the commission has been pushing, at least in this preliminary report, we pushed for an expansion of some of these notions of harm in the privacy concept. So we have context. time for one more quick question, Baron. Could you just clarify what you mean about that case? When you say you think that it, it should have been brought as an unfairness case, do you mean to say that you think that the unfairness um, doctrine should have been understood at the time to have, uh, to have applied in that case, such that that would have constituted uh, an adequate harm under the doctrine. What I'm trying to say is I think it was wedged into the deception framework. I think it was, I, look, I think the commission did a fine job. I don't have any problems with the case. I think it was perfectly fine to allege it as deception, perfectly fine to, fine to allege it as unfairness. I think if we were to bring that case today, it would be alleged as unfairness. Okay, so, so what I'm getting at, Howard Beals has raised this question. So it was yes. Howard, of course, who announced Howard and that I case. debate all the time. Right, and, and I think it was you and Howard that had this conversation at the IAPP conference yes, uh, last, earlier yes, this year. Yes, we did. And, and it just, I think it might be helpful just for you to share a little bit of your view here because uh, Howard at, at that uh, event basically responded to the draft uh, report and said that he, he, when he was drafting, he was involved in the drafting of the unfairness um, policy statement as I understand it. Could be. And that, that, that he, it was his view that um, the commission never intended for that uh, statement to be interpreted so narrowly as to leave the commission toothless as to pursue exactly this sort of case. Yes. And thus he was arguing that in fact the, uh, the staff report was, um, was not doing justice to how, to how broadly that authority could be construed as a way of, of arguing for new authority. And so and thus his argument was that the FTC should be able to use its existing authority to bring just this sort of enforcement action. You know, that's interesting. I, I think that's part of what he said, but he said some other things too. Howard Beals was the former um, a director of the Bureau of Consumer Protection and an economist, interestingly. He's not trained as a lawyer, he's trained as an economist. Um, he, you remember, he also said, consume, you know, what's all the fuss about all this? Consumers, you know, don't want to have to deal with all these choices, they just want it to work. Remember, he talked about that too, which I thought was a great, you know, lead in to my point about it should be a lot more built under the hood, not, not on the dashboard. But um, yeah, I think, I think there are a lot of people who talk a lot about our unfairness jurisdiction, not only in the consumer protection context, but also in the competition context, and do believe that the commission should be bolder in using it. Um, and, and Howard may very well have said that, Baron. I, I, I don't remember that particular comment. Um, but I do think he, he, but he was the he was the head of the Bureau of Consumer Protection when it was alleged to be a, a violation of deception or unfairness. If he felt as strongly as he claimed in March, why did he bring in the deception count? Um, I want to uh, get to some necessary but important uh, housekeeping at the very end. But before I do that, please join me in thanking Commissioner Brill. So, so 
briefly, and you, get, you can keep your seat. This will only take a minute. I've got two things I'd like to do. The first is, um, once again, just reiterate the thank yous, and I'm going to do this in a way that everyone in the room can be thanked. Um, but first and foremost, the staff really um, did an incredible job. And once again, to Lauren Bozel, thank you very much. Um, I, I'll tell you one of the questions on our exam later. So. Um, thanks again to um, the sponsors for their participation. Thank you to all the panelists. I don't think it was highlighted well enough that Chris Hoofnagel, Scott Peppett, and Alicia McDonald, you know, 48 hours ago, didn't know they were on the panels they were on. Um, and they did an amazing job of stepping up and enriching the conversation. Um, and of course, I want to thank um, all of you in this room and also those of you watching on TV. Um, thank you very much for a really stimulating day of conversation. But, but I can't let the moment pass without talking about how we continue this conversation. So let me offer um, a couple of things. And what I'll do is I'll start with a broad time horizon and, and narrow myself down. Um, I've kind of had this idea in the back of my head for a long time. And I thought, if I just say it out loud now, it'll come true. Um, so the last day of the semester in 2012, we will have a conference on the technology of privacy. Uh, where we're going to replace economists with computer scientists and programmers. Um, and we're going to try and get at the very different questions that we kind of touched on today, but didn't nearly get to dive into enough. Um, this summer, you should all be looking in your mailboxes if you subscribe to the Journal on Telecommunications and High Tech Law uh, for the articles coming out of this conference. As I've said many times today, I think it'll have a long shelf life. Um, the, the center here has a long tradition of taking productive conference days and trying to make more of it, trying to work it into our policy agenda, into our uh, scholarly agenda. One thing we often do is two-hour roundtables where we can dive a little more deeply into a very narrow question. I'm intrigued to hear from all of you uh, later about when we might do that and what we might do. Uh, but last and perhaps most importantly, uh, we have alcohol in the room next door. Uh, we have a reception, and I, and I invite you all to attend. I will say, you can't have two Phil Weiser rules. So this is the Phil Weiser directive. He says this at the end of every conference. If you choose to go to the reception, and we invite you to, your one rule is to seek out and speak to a law student, talk to them about what you do, talk to them about what they should do as they begin their careers as lawyers, and more importantly, most importantly, if you have a job to give them, we have amazing students here. Um, and so please begin to lay the groundwork to make that happen. So once again, thank you very, very much.